Welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we're going to talk about the most collectible SG of the 70s, the Gibson SG Exclusive. Now calling it the most collectible SG of the 70s, that might sound like quite an exclusive title, but to be honest, there were not that many limited edition SGs in the 70s. So it's pretty much the only one up there besides the Sam Ash SG200. But to help us understand this guitar, let's go ahead and talk about 70s SGs real quick. There were quite a few different iterations, but not as many as like today. At the bottom of the barrel, you had the SG Melody Maker type guitars. They weren't actually called Melody Makers anymore, and they took over the Melody Maker names, but that's like the SG100 and the SG1 series. And then you had things like the vintage SG standards very early in 1970 and for a few years after that. It still kind of looked like the late 60s versions, but then they moved into the top route era with like the SG Deluxe. There was an SG Pro with P90 pickups, eventually moving on to the SG Standard. Other ones like the SG Special, which had mini humbuckers. And of course, you can't forget the SG Customs within this era, both top routed and back routed. And then in the late 70s, you had something called this. It was just the SG. It was made of all walnut. But you can check out this video for more information on one of these guys. So that leaves us to talk about this. This was a limited edition SG. It's rumored that there are meant to be 500 of these things made, but only 478 are on the shipping ledgers. To be honest, when it comes to 70s and knowing exact numbers, even the numbers that are quoted all the time, half the time they're really wrong. <laughs> I personally know that because the number that's quoted all the time on 2550s is 3,411, but I've seen limited edition number stamps go slightly higher than that. And as we all know, the spotlight specials, everybody says there's only 211 of them, but that was just 211 in 1983. They went on into 84, and I've seen at least one from 85. So that's a good way to get the general gist of how many there are, around 500. But as I was talking about earlier, there were not that many limited edition SGs. Because limited special edition guitars really wasn't a big thing until like the mid to late 70s. We're talking things like the V Les Paul, the 2550th anniversary, then the special runs like the Artist and the Artisan. And that's not to say that there weren't limited editions before this time, it just meant it started to become more commonplace in that mid to late 70s. And then from there it just kind of blossomed and that's why I love Gibson guitars. There's so many really cool iterations out there, it's fun to document each and every single one of them. So what makes this guitar special? Because I remember seeing these and just going, what's the big deal? It's got cream plastics and it's black. Is it really that special? And you're probably thinking the same thing, but you are wrong. This thing is so special. There's a good seven, eight features that is not on any other SG. So first off, the black finish is actually really special. This color was not offered in the 70s. It might come as a shock to you because a black SG standard kind of seems to be commonplace nowadays when you want to buy one on the used market. But it was not standard option on an SG standard at the time. There was an SG special that had everything else that was a standard configuration but dot inlays that a lot of people mistakenly call a standard that had a black finish, but that was not a true SG standard. Next up, we've got our cream plastics and pickups, kind of as we were talking about earlier. You could say that this reminds you of the Les Paul KM, which it did come out about the same time. And the other thing that it has in common with that is every single one of these was Kalamazoo made. So that's something this has over most SGs at the time. Most of them weren't Kalamazoo made. So you might be thinking, oh, is this another one that has double cream T-tops? No, these actually have Dirty Fingers pickups. And that's something else that's kind of special. That's like the introduction era of these guys. A lot of people don't know these were birthed in the late 70s. Everybody always thinks the early 80s because that's when they started to become more popular in different models. So these are really hot pickups. Another model you could find the double cream dirty fingers in is like the 335 CCR. That was also a late 70s model. And then into the 80s, there were a bunch of other stuff, but one you could know about is the V. You could also check out something like the GK55. But another feature that nobody ever talks about on these guys is something else that it keeps in common with the GK55 model, but it's a little bit even more special on this one. Take a look at this knob. Tell me, what does that say? Does it say, Tone? No, it says tap. As far as I'm aware, this is the only model that has a knob that says tap on it. So this little bit, if somebody swapped your knobs out, you're missing something super special on your SG exclusive. But you're probably wondering, why does it say tap? What is that even doing? This is a spin-a-split knob. 
The GK55 was the only other model that I'm aware of that also utilized this technology, but this was very early coil splitting days for Gibson, back when they still mistakenly called it a coil tap. So with the 2550th anniversary being the first one, it had that little switch, you'd flick it on and off, but this was like the next evolution of that, and it's this little splitter. So instead of just having ice picky bright and regular humbucker, what this allows you to do is you can roll it off just a little bit. So I think what it's technically doing is it is tapping it, taking some of the windings out, but then once you have it off, it is completely split. So you're just running one of the coils. So that is a super unique feature that is only on this SG and the GK55. Because apparently people didn't like it or they just kind of gave up on it too early because we eventually went to push push pots and then eventually push poles. Continuing on here, the harmonica bridge, that's not special. That was on all the 70s SGs, but the TP6 tailpiece was something relatively new and special for a guitar like this. It's a fine tuner tailpiece, kind of like what you see on a Floyd Rose or a violin. You can use this to do some fine tuning if you want. For me, it's mainly about ease of string change. You don't have to wrap anything through. You can just easily take them out here and they look pretty fancy. And you normally only found this on the higher end guitars that were limited editions like this one. Speaking of the fancy guitars, this one also has a brass nut like you would find on a Les Paul Artist. Brass was big at this time for sustain. So having this factory stock is another interesting thing. You also have that limited edition truss rod cover that says exclusive on it. The Grover tuners could be special depending on which model, but once again, Kalamazoo made. So once you actually take the time to lay out every little thing that's super special about this SG, it's no wonder people are finally starting to discover these things and go, huh, that is a pretty collectible model, isn't it? And it doesn't help that, you know, the SG standards of the 70s and 80s have just been skyrocketing in value because they were critically undervalued for quite some time but then Chicago Music Exchange kind of helped correct that. So as the standards continue to raise in value you see these guys start to become more valuable as well especially now that more people know about them. So now that we know what makes this thing special let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. The sad thing is, is I started this review about nine months ago, but it just kind of fell to the wayside because it was going to be a back-to-back -back review with that GK55. But finally, let's go ahead and take a look at the SG Exclusive up close and personal. I mean, you can tell this was definitely kind of more of a player's model. It's got nicks and dings all over it. I think I did a small touch-up right here when I first got it, and I had to restore some of these original parts. But let's go ahead and take a look at this thing. So the pickups in here, once again, they are T-top dirty fingers. So just because it has the T's on the top does not make this a T-top because the more important feature is the double row of pole pieces. So these are hot ceramic pickups and they actually have a double lead coming out of them. That's just how they did these old coil splittable pickups. Whereas nowadays they just have four conductors coming out of one wire. But inside the pickup cavities here, you can see through to the mahogany body and there's nothing, you know, too crazy or special going on here. But this bridge pickup actually has been replaced. This came from that GK55 that I reviewed. I think when I purchased this, that had like a double white DiMarzio in it. But this guitar is so special, I wanted to make sure that it got restored. And the person who bought that GK55 bought it without the pickups anyway. So that just worked out perfectly. But here's how the harmonica bridge system works. You just kind of have these larger studs right here and they have that little slotted screw driver here that you can use to move it up and down. So honestly, this system was kind of ahead of its time for as far as Gibson does their stuff. Usually you have to use the thumb wheels. But here is our harmonica bridge itself. What's great about these things is look at all the intonation adjustment room. It's been rumored that they started to use these. Like if the neck was set wrong or something, they could just correct it down here. <laughs> Nowadays, you just get the advantage of having all this adjustment room. And then our bridge here, this TP6 is not stock to this particular guitar, but it is era correct. It's another piece that I added to it but it says Gibson made in USA. That's one of the few parts that Gibson actually made themselves. This is a Rendell Wall creation. And the backside of the harmonica bridge reads made in Germany. These were Schaller made. As far as our controls go, it is master volume and then independent tone controls. And then you have that coil split a switch thing here going on. And just your standard white plastics right here. And then the pick guards really aged this nice dark yellow color. So that's looking pretty good. No funky routes under here. 
But to demonstrate this, so this one reads about 15.66k ohms, but then as you slowly move this down, it takes some of the windings out, apparently, something like that, so you can get all the way in between. And what makes that really special is back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, this was fairly new technology. It's really ice picky when you have it completely split. So that gives you some more usable tones if you want something more single coil and territory. But moving on from the mahogany body, we have a mahogany neck on this guy. The SGs did not switch to maple. You can see the mahogany right there, and it's just your standard rosewood fretboard of the day. So you can see some minor tooling marks on this fretboard. You've got some wear to the frets. I really love these mother of pearl small block inlays. And it's got the standard 12 inch fretboard radius. Now, as far as our scale length goes, nothing too crazy here either, 24 and three quarters inches. Moving on to our nut, it looks like we got a 1.56 inch nut width. If you don't like the skinnier nut width of most of the 70s SGs, go for a V SG from 1979 because those have a more standard nut width. But by the 12th, this one is 2.01. First fret neck depth, we're looking at 0.8. Then it really beefs up on this one. It's almost a perfect one by the 12th. These are always really interesting neck profiles. So they start off small and skinny, but then they get really beefy, chunky, and rounded towards the end. Okay, so the headstock, once again, mahogany neck. Truss rods are working just fine and it's in great shape. You've got the crown emblem that most of the SGs do have. And then the Gibson logo as that was styled back then. And here's an up close look at this. I kind of wish they would have went with a brass truss rod cover just to make it a little bit more special, but it just says exclusive on it. And just for full disclosure, the bottom screw has actually been replaced on this. Moving on to the back side here, you can see all the little nicks and dings that this one had. I remember when I purchased this guitar, it was really filthy, so I actually took that Virtuoso polish and really went to town on this one. I mean, if you get it in the light just right, you can see all these impressions and whatnot, but it still presents itself pretty well. But let's go ahead and take a look at the electronics in this thing. Remember, I did have to replace that one pickup, so this is not how it would look 100% factory stock. Can you tell which one's my work and which one's factory? Mine factory. <laughs> Unfortunately, now I remember why I stopped doing this review. I couldn't get the bridge pickup to be hooked up right, despite doing it exactly how it was before. So this second one is supposed to connect down here underneath that first one. And whenever I do that, it just doesn't work for some reason. I actually had some strange success connecting it to where this little brown wire was that actually turned the second tone pot into another splitter pot. But then as soon as I soldered it into place, it didn't do that anymore. So I'm just gonna leave this bear and leave it up to the next owner to decide if they want to do it or not. As of right now, the neck pickup works properly. And the bridge pickup should be humbucker mode. But if you want it to be the opposite way, you can just switch which pickup lead you're using. So I know this pickup 100% works, it just depends on however you figure out how to wire this thing up, because I'm not having any luck here. But basically this whole tilt-a-whirl thing is just a stacked pot. So I don't really know how that's working, but as you turn it down, I'm sure it just runs some resistance through a different pot. You've got other stuff going on. But this one dates to the 18th week of 1978, and this is the 20th week of 1978. And unfortunately, that guy's covered over, as is this one. So those pots were pretty much a year old by the time they used them. But the backside actually does have some shielding on it. Though I'm not sure if that was added after the fact or not. Sometimes you can find it, sometimes you don't. Also, for full disclosure back here, I believe pretty much every single one of these screws has been replaced. These ones just seem a little bit too large, and that one seems too small. But you can see you've got a little bit of beveling back here for the SG edges, and your strap button is located in the usual position down here. Looks like we got a little bit of edge wear back here. Very light beveling here, and then our other strap button at the base of the heel. Moving up the back of the neck here, you can definitely tell this one was a player. You've got some minor impressions here, and a slightly more major one right there. But thankfully, it is break, crack, and repair free, so it made it worthwhile to restore. Now, if you get it in the light just right, you can tell it is actually a three-piece mahogany neck. And here is the Made in USA stamp, stamped vertically, meaning Kalamazoo made. You can also tell because this is $4.99 or less. This was made in 1979 on the 145th day of the year. And here's our vintage Grover tuners. This example weighs seven pounds, 9.7 .7 ounces. Let's go ahead and walk through its tones. <laughs>
now that we know all about the Gibson SG exclusive, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Is it something that everybody needs to rush out and get? No, probably not. But if you're a collector of the weird oddball models and limited editions, it's a must have. And I really don't think enough people knew about these because previous to today, these really didn't sell for that much more than a regular SG. And I really think that just comes down to people didn't know about this model. So I don't know if this video is gonna inflate these things in price or not, but I really do believe they're critically undervalued. I mean, I would assume something like this would get like a 50% premium over top of a regular SG, but only time can tell for these SG exclusives. But as far as a guitar for the gigging man, um, the, the coil tap thing, tilt a whirl, it's not my favorite, but I love that you can dial in a bunch of different tones. I actually like the dirty fingers when they're split, but I think that's because they're hot pickups and then they go down to what you're normally used to hearing around the 8K ohm territory. Whereas if you take a PAF from a little under eight down to four, it kind of sounds thin and weak. So the tones are actually very usable out of this thing. It's just much easier to use a switch rather than a spin knob here. So even though this is a more versatile way to do it, I can definitely see why technology continued to advance until we eventually got the push push and push pull pots because those definitely work a little bit easier than these guys. I was actually really happy with the clean tones out of this. The distorted tones they didn't really speak to me today but maybe I'm just not running it through the right amp and pedal. Also keep in mind that bridge pickup was definitely in the single coil position so that kind of messes up your middle tone position makes it chimier and made that bridge pickup a lot brighter than it could be. So in a factory stock example it wouldn't quite be as ice picky. You could get a bunch of different tonal opportunities out of this thing. And you could do that with this one too you just gotta figure out however to wire it up correctly. So now that my little history lesson is done for this one if you're interested in being the next owner let's go ahead and briefly go over our condition here. The face of the headstock has lots of light scratches. You can see there's some wear along the edges of the headstock. I mean, this is definitely not a mint condition guitar. I can touch these small parts up with my lacquer pen if you want me to, but I left most of those alone. I did not notice any major issues while playing this guitar, but if you're really picky, you might want to do a level recrown job or maybe even refret it. But if you're used to those low wide frets of the Norlin era, you're going to be fine with this guitar. Going over the face of the guitar, you can definitely see impressions, light scratches, nicks and dings. It was definitely somebody's player. So as far as this one being a collectible example, not really, but it's not trashed either. So this is for the collector that just likes to have a bunch of different stuff, but doesn't necessarily have to have a mint condition example. Moving on to the back side of the neck, kind of similar to what we saw on the workbench, you do have some impressions on the back side. I know these dings can look pretty bad, but honestly, I don't even feel them while I'm playing it. And then all the wear and tear here on the back. So basically all you have to do is take this to a luthier or setup guy that knows how to do some wiring work so he can troubleshoot which wires go where because I can vouch that the pickup works. It worked in the other guitar and I've been able to get the split coil sound as well as the full humbucker sound depending on how I wired it. But for whatever reason, I could not get that bridge pickup to go back in correctly. Let's go ahead and check it out under black light. Now here's a black light test. You can see the sweat absorption in this area a little bit here as well. And the pickups have aged a little bit differently, but it is an era correct replacement. And even your pick card kind of has a cool glow here as well as your knobs. Now this little area looks like some of the clear coat might've been rubbed through. And I did do a small touch up right here, but that's not a crack or anything. It's just some of the finish kind of chipped off. Moving up to the face of the headstock. Everything's looking good here. Moving on to the back, also looking good, but here you can also see those light finish wear areas along the edges. The neck is brake, crack, and repair free. You can see a little bit of an area of wear right here. I mean, that means somebody was definitely doing a lot of soloing. <laughs> and there's a small chip in the finish right there. Got some rubbing here. So overall, respectable condition. I mean, it's definitely got wear from a strap down here as well. It's not 100% perfect and maybe some sort of a touch up right here. But overall, a pretty nice example of one of these. Not perfect, but good enough for most of the players out there. As far as cases go, these originally would have came with a Gen 2 chainsaw case or the standard SG case of the era, but this one has been upgraded slash modernized into a regular Gibson USA case. This looks like an early 2000s version to me. But the interior, it's a nice dark, kind of dog hair gray color. It's got great heel support. So it's a nice case, but not the original case. 
troglodytes. I hope you enjoyed learning about the Gibson SG exclusive. If you're interested in being the next owner of this particular one or any of the other SGs you saw in this video, I'll leave a link in the description to the Reverb for Sale page. It's kind of a quirky guitar, not for everyone, but one of the few limited edition 70s SGs that existed. All right, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.